June 1987 in Tunbridge Wells, Kent, had been cool and wet. The summer hadn't yet shown itself. By the 22nd of June, there'd been just two days of sun and twice as much rain as normally expected for the month. That fun feeling of early summer hadn't arrived. There was yet to be those long, hazy evenings outside, pubs on the edge of the local park, or the lingering warmth of brick walls along the street after a long summer's day. 25-year-old Wendy Nell managed the local photo print store Super Snaps. She was happy there. Her relationship with bus driver Ian was going well, and they were getting serious. But she still thrived on the independence of living on her own. She could walk to work on the busy Camden Road in 15 to 20 minutes from her ground floor bedsit on Guildford Road, a small street of three-storey houses, many of them converted to bedsits and single flats. Her house was made up of nine bedsits in total, a quiet road, a dead end to cars, but with a small lane at the end of the cul-de-sac where it was possible to walk or cycle through, to the Grove, a small local park with a playground and a pub backing onto it. Running behind the house was another alleyway, and the north end of Guildford Road led towards the main part of town and Wendy's route to work. That route ran alongside another large park, Carverley Grounds. The area had a community feel. It was safe, and the residents felt secure. There had been rumours on the road of a prowler, but many felt it was nothing to worry about, and no one thought much of it until the night of Monday, June 22nd, 1987, when Tunbridge Wells and the Kent locals would realise the rumours were true. My name's Benjamin Fitton from They Walk Among Us. Welcome to Murder Town, the podcast. Following each episode of Crime and Investigation's brand new true crime TV series, we'll explore another case right here. Ian and Wendy had spent the evening together after they'd both got off work. It was just gone 11pm as they pulled up on Ian's motorbike out of the front of her place. Ian wasn't going in. They both had work the following day, so he waited until Wendy went inside, waving to each other before Ian went home. The following morning, Wendy didn't turn up for work, so staff at the photo store called Ian to stop by a place to see if she was okay. There may have been an innocent reason she had not got up yet. Maybe she overslept or was unwell and forgot to call into work. Her room was at the back of the house on the ground floor. It faced the garden and the alleyway at the back. Reports at the time state that Ian went around the back to a window. What he found was that Wendy was neither unwell or asleep. When Ian called 999, he was in shock and distraught as he described his girlfriend dead. Her naked, battered body covered in blood in her bed. Wendy's father, Bill, received a phone call from the police inspector. Something was wrong with Wendy. Her mother Pam was in a panic because their daughter hadn't turned up to work and she couldn't locate her. Bill drove straight to Guildford Road and as he approached the end of the cul-de-sac he saw police cars. They would not let him near the property. In fact, they would not even let him drive home to Pam. After telling him that Wendy had died, they escorted him home to break the news to his wife. When police arrived, they found Wendy had been strangled and severely beaten an autopsy also revealing she too had been sexually assaulted. There was no sign of forced entry, but they did find her window didn't lock. The latch had been painted over. In Wendy's bedsit, police found a shoe print on her blouse which lay on the floor. The print wasn't hers, nor was it Ian's, her family's or anyone in the house. It was from a rare style of Clark's trainer. Officers hoped that the print was unusual enough that someone might recognise it. Possibly no someone who owned the trainers. This footprint became the only physical piece of evidence the police had to go on. A thorough search showed that Wendy's keys were missing. Her key ring had a leather fob with multi-coloured frayed fringing around the edge and a small brass cowbell. It was a souvenir type key ring with a miniature scenic picture on the bell. Also attached to the fob was a long brass keyring with Woman of the Year engraved on it. Chubb deadbolt key for the front door, 
and a regular key which opened her room. Detectives also discovered that a diary was missing. Still to this day, these items have never been recovered, possibly kept as trophies by the killer. Ian was ruled out as a suspect. Wendy had no enemies. There was nothing in her life that police suspected had anything to do with her murder. There was no indication that she had felt threatened or stalked in the lead-up, but according to police there was every chance she was targeted and very likely stalked specifically that night. According to detectives, there were only two scenarios. Either the killer entered her flat before she got home and lay in wait for her, or the killer, lurking as she returned home, waited until she was in bed and broke in. It was not the sort of street an opportunistic killer would be hanging around hoping for someone to cross their path. The laneways behind the houses in Wendy's Road and at the end proved a perfect escape for anyone on foot, with parks both north and south of Guildford Road and each park with numerous entrances, the killer had an easy escape in the dark. Knocking door to door revealed that no one had heard anything strange at all that night, but a 19-year-old neighbour told police that a few days earlier, a man approached her door and warned her not to leave her windows unlocked. With her help, police were able to develop an e-fit of the man who approached her, and it was released with the police stating he was someone they wished to speak to. He had dark cropped hair, neatly parted on the left with a heavy moustache. From the e-fit, the man looked around 35 years old. Whether this was the killer or an innocent coincidence, no one knows. No one ever came forward or was matched to the photo e-fit. Even though capabilities of DNA profiling in crime labs were still to come, detectives were aware that biological evidence collection was crucial. Minute traces of semen were found and stored, but obtaining any sort of DNA profile from this was still a long way in the future. At the time of Wendy's murder, Leicestershire police were on the verge of arresting Colin Pitchfork, who was to become the world's first criminal caught and convicted as a result of mass DNA screening and DNA profiling. So in Wendy's case, it was pretty common for police to take swabs and put them into evidence until such a time something could be done with them. Police had little to go on, and as July and August rolled on, there were no further leads in the case. In October that year, southern England suffered the worst storm in over 200 years. The Great Storm, as it is now referred to, hit Kent particularly severely. Tunbridge Wells, one of the places bearing the heavy brunt of the storm. In all, 18 people died as a result and hundreds were injured. There was an outcry as the country felt there was no warning from meteorologists. No one had time to prepare and the local evening's weather report just hours before the storm dismissed claims a hurricane was on its way, just some bad weather. The 100 mile per hour winds brought trees down all over the country, flattening cars, destroying homes and rail lines. There was no power for days and many roads closed with enormous trees ripped from the ground. The Tunbridge Wells community all came together to help each other, to get businesses up and running again and schools back together as the clean-up would take months. As the town was just getting back on its feet from the great storm, police believed the killer of Wendy Nell was quietly getting ready to strike again. Six weeks after the storm hit and five months after Wendy's murder, 20-year-old Caroline Pierce had been on a night out with friends when at around midnight she headed to a ground floor bedsit in Grosvenor Park, one mile north of where Wendy Nell had lived. A taxi dropped her off and left. The following day, Caroline didn't show up for work at the restaurant she managed on Camden Road, the same road Wendy Nell had worked on. When Caroline was reported missing, police were alarmed at the similarities in the murder of Wendy Nell and the disappearance of Caroline Pierce. Both worked on the same road, both lived alone in ground floor bedsits on dead end streets. Both lived within a mile from their work and a mile from each other. Both women resembled the other two with their short cropped dark hair. There was no indication the two women knew each other, but it was found they both frequented the same calf, so they may have known each other by face. But with no sign of Caroline anywhere, police were left scratching their heads and wondering if the two cases were just coincidence. 
After all, there was no sign that anything sinister had happened to Caroline. Caroline didn't have a boyfriend, and like Wendy, police found no evidence that she had been stalked. There was no indication that she had feared for her safety in any way, but with the knowledge that Wendy Nell was unaware she was being followed, there was a chance too that Caroline didn't know. But Caroline could not be found. Her friend she was out with that evening said nothing out of the ordinary had occurred. Detectives discovered that the taxi driver had not seen or heard anything, but that a neighbour had heard a woman scream at the time the taxi dropped Caroline off, hearing, no, no, then a sob, and then nothing. A newspaper reported at the time that the neighbour said that after hearing the scream and looking out of the window, they saw a car, facing the dead end of their street, slowly reversing. The street, barely with any streetlights, was dark. Another neighbour reported that shortly before the time Caroline was dropped off by the taxi, they saw an unknown car in the street with no one in it. This was all the police had to go on, but with the similarities between the two women, police were confident there was a link. They felt that there was a possibility the assailant had intended to follow Caroline into her flat, which according to local news reports at the time, the door she usually entered was situated at the side of the house but they felt that when she screamed, the attacker dragged her away, possibly into a car. The main link between the two women, one murdered and one missing, was that they both worked on Camden Road, one of the busiest shopping streets in Tunbridge Wells, at the time full of independent stores and up-and-coming chains and pubs. It's hard to ignore the link to the street, and with both women often walking around the area, could the person responsible have had ties to the road or spent much of his time there? All the stores along the road are on the ground floor of the building, mostly consisting of three stories. Hundreds of windows of flats, bedsits and offices all looking down on the street which also had a market. After the storm, construction in the area began to boom. Insurances were being paid out. Odd jobmen, builders, electricians and other tradesmen were all busy renewing and repairing the town. The Royal Victoria Place shopping centre had been earmarked for construction and that year an early development of the Channel Tunnel to France had begun 60 miles away in Dover. It was a busy time for Kent. On December 15th that year, three weeks after Caroline Pierce went missing, a worker on a farm 40 miles southeast of Tunbridge Wells near the coast at St Mary in the Marsh, Romney Marsh, discovered her decomposing body in a drainage ditch. The area was isolated and known by locals as not easy to navigate if you don't know where you're going. When Caroline was abducted, she was wearing a long black skirt, a red jumper and tights. She was found wearing her tights, but the rest of her clothing was missing. Her handbag was found nearby but her keys had disappeared. Autopsy reports showed that like Wendy, Caroline had been beaten, she had been raped, strangled, and it was believed she was dumped on Romney Marsh the night she disappeared. Detectives were by now convinced that the same man was responsible for both murders, and the two investigations were officially linked. Within three days of the discovery of Caroline's body, police had set up a confidential telephone line. Police had the photo fit from Wendy's neighbour, but this was created not of a man seen on that night, but the suspicious man seen days prior to Wendy going missing. There were no witnesses who had seen anything on the night Caroline was abducted. So without a definitive suspect sketch, police needed to build a profile with what they had. Caroline being dumped 40 miles away showed the perpetrator either owned or at least had access to a car. This also backed up the two witnesses who had seen a car in Caroline's road that night. It appeared that he may have had knowledge of the areas the two girls lived. He had the confidence to approach streets both with dead ends to cars, both with many residents on the street, and the types of communities where neighbours appeared to know if something was unusual. An interesting point is that both roads lead via footpaths to parks where there were many routes to escape by or hide if need be. Both attacks seemed to be planned, the suspect either lay in wait or followed both women as they approached home. One thing about both attacks was that they were extremely violent and the magnitude of violence was so evident that it led police to assume that it was not the murderer's first physical offence. 
Either he had been built up to this level or had struck in a similar fashion before, possibly in a domestic or family violence situation. Attacking Wendy inside the home showed that he may have committed other burglaries. Despite persistence by the police and the confidence that the right lead or the right piece of the puzzle would come together, the case slowed, and then it stopped. It went cold. As time went on, both of the women's cases featured on Crime Watch and both gained tips, leads and even names, but none of them leading anywhere. In 1999, a new DNA profiling technique, an extension of a prior technique, had been established by the UK Forensic Science Service and was put into use in criminal investigations. The technique, called low copy number, a very sensitive test, involves a higher amount of copying via polymerase chain reaction. Essentially, instead of needing biological evidence from a suspect the size of a 50p coin, the new process made it possible to obtain a full DNA profile from a specimen of blood, or semen for example, smaller than a grain of salt or from less than a few cells. This minute trace of DNA can even be extracted from a few skin cells or sweat left behind on a fingerprint. The environment can greatly affect the quality of DNA. Both the environment at the scene of the crime or the environment in which the DNA is gathered and stored. There is a high risk for contamination with such small trace amounts of DNA and this was shown when at the end of 2008 a halt was put on this type of low copy number evidence being admissible in UK courts. The ban was lifted not long after however. The trace DNA that had been saved by detectives in Wendy Nell's case 20 years earlier was about to come out of the file and be tested. If it was contaminated or degraded too much, the new low copy number method would not work and the evidence possibly destroyed for further testing. This is a decision made in the background that can often delay the testing of cold case evidence. It's a fine line. The killer, who in 1987 would have no inclination that this type of evidence would one day paint an almost full picture of him, left a small amount of semen on Wendy Nell's clothing. In 2007, it was decided that forensic testing had advanced enough to attempt to obtain the DNA profile of the killer. It was a positive result, and the killer's full DNA profile was in the hands of detectives police were able to enter his profile into the National Criminal DNA Database, a centralised system set up in the UK in 1995, where every criminal arrested for an offence that could lead to imprisonment has to provide a mouth swab and has their DNA added to the system. By the time Wendy's killer and the killer of Caroline's DNA was uploaded, the UK database contained around 4 million criminal profiles. One report claims that beside those men already listed within the criminal system, 500 other men were also tested in the community against the killer and no match came back. As the database grows, the killer's DNA is re-uploaded, but still to this day, 31 years after the two murders, despite having his DNA profile, the killer has never been identified. Another appeal was put out on Crime Watch, and familial searches of the database began in the hope that a relative, even a distant one, would show up on the system. One has yet to come up. When it became public that the bedsick killer's DNA profile was on record, the police were inundated with public requests to look into the other serial offenders who were already on file. High-profile and recently captured Scottish serial rapist and killer Peter Tobin was brought up in relation to both Wendy and Caroline's murders, as was Levi Belfield a little later on, but both men, like many others now, cleared by DNA. In 2012, on the 25th anniversary of the murder of Wendy Nell, her parents joined forces with Kent Police to make a fresh appeal to the public. They spoke at a press conference stating they did not want to die not knowing what happened to their daughter. Shortly after Caroline's murder, her parents moved and have remained completely private ever since. The head of Kent Police's cold case investigation team, Detective Chief Inspector Dave Withers said, the investigation into the murders of Caroline Pierce and Wendy Nell have never been closed. The cases have been regularly reviewed as new information comes to the police or new forensic opportunities become available. 
the chances that a person capable of this magnitude of violence, and it being that person's first and last attacks, is slim. These are the types of crimes that are usually built up to over a period of time. To have not shown up on the UK database since its inception may indicate that a serious crime has not been committed since that date. It could mean that the suspect died. It could mean that the suspect left the country, possibly even shortly after the murder of Caroline Pierce. The latter part of the 1980s was a pivotal time in DNA evidence being collected at crime scenes and genetic testing capabilities changed rapidly. Could this time period and the fear of getting caught have sparked a move or a change in MO? Or did it scare the killer into never committing another crime again? Does somebody out there still know something? Something about the way someone was behaving around this time? Has someone out there found items which seem like souvenirs that aren't theirs? A diary? Sets of car keys hidden away like mementos? Possibly they have been too scared to talk for fear of their own lives? Maybe with growing older, alliances have changed. Maybe there's no need to protect this person anymore. Even after all this time, someone could still come forward, still help find that missing piece of the puzzle that can solve the unsolved murders of Wendy Nell and Caroline Pierce finally giving closure to the two families and all the loved ones left behind. I'm Catherine Kelly, host of Crime and Investigation's brand new true crime TV series, Murder Town. Join me next Monday at 9pm as I visit Dundee. We'll be taking a look at the story of a 15-year-old murderer. For more information on the series, Head to crimeandinvestigation.co.uk and let us know your thoughts by searching for Crime and Investigation on social media or using hashtag MurderTown. The MurderTown podcast is hosted by Benjamin Fitton, written by Anna Priestland, produced by Sam Pearson and Chloe Frost, with editing by James Colopy. Music